In this video, I'm going to explain why you should not be using the Midas DN4816 o as a digital split for your self-contained IEM system. Hello, if you're new to my channel, my name is Árni and I'm a professional audio engineer living in Akureyri, Iceland. I have worked full-time as an audio professional since 2011, both as an employee of, of a multi-purpose concert and conference hall, and in my freelance career I've worked some of the biggest events in my country where I've been mixing monitors and IEMs, working as a patch on stage, doing frequency coordination, and most other jobs related to audio. I also play bass in a cover band and we have our own IEM setup. I've made a few videos explaining our setup and the thought that went into making that. You can click above to watch the video where I explain the wing rack setup we have. Now just as a disclaimer, in this video I'm going to be telling you my opinion based on my experience as a live sound professional. If you believe I'm wrong or you just disagree with me, please put so in the comments below. Earlier this week, I did a live stream where I talked about microphone splitters. I did want to make a quick summary on that video because not everyone is willing to watch a 45 minute live video. If you do however want to watch that video, I'll link that above. The topic of this video is specifically about the Midas DN4816 o which is a 16 output rack which is part of the Midas and Behringer ecosystem. I have seen numerous posts on both Facebook and Reddit where people are asking if they can use that as a digital split for their IM system. I have also seen way too many videos here on YouTube where people are using that as an output of a split system. So what is the DN4816 you might ask? It is a 16 XLR output, one U rack device that uses Stage Connect, which is a protocol developed by Music Tribe, which own Behringer, Midas, amongst some other brands. It allows you to send multiple channels of audio over a single 110 ohm XLR cable. This device is great for what it's intended for. A good way to get more outputs out of your device. I have one and I use it with my Behringer wing rack. It is not, however, as I've seen man many people refer to it as, a good way to do a digital split for your IEM system. So why not use the 4816 as a split? If you are using the 4816 as a split, it means that you'll be running all the channels through your setup. It will be going into your device through your preamp and AT converters. It will go through the software and back through the DA converters of the 4816. Now, this doesn't have to be bad, but I'm going to explain the scenarios where it can be just so people understand. Number one, gain is a preference. There are lots of best practices in regarding to gain structure, but in the end, it is a preference of the, of the operator. Some people like to leave a bit of headroom while other people want to run the preamps hot to get any sort of saturation or character that it might have. Input gain is the first step of the signal chain and it will affect everything downstream. It will affect the threshold of the compressors, it will affect the sand level of the EQs, it will affect how, like, where you keep your fader. And even there are best practices, there are no rules and all of these things are a personal preference of the operator. If you're running the thing through your own preamps first before it goes to front of house, you're taking control of this important step of the signal chain away from the front of house engineer. Number two, not all consoles are happy with a line level input. Most of the situations where I see the 4816 being used as a splitter is for bands that are running their own IEM rigs and are using a venue or festival supplied front of house console and usually an engineer as well. Now in that situations, not all mixing consoles happily accept line level inputs into their mic preamps. Some of them might have built in pads to reduce the levels, but not all of them. If you're touring and using house consoles, that's not really something you can count on in advance and it can cause problems for you or the engineer at the venue. Number three, you are a musician playing a show. When you're playing a show, that's what you're doing. You are not and should not be actively monitoring the input gains on every channel. But guess what? There is usually someone at front of house getting paid to do exactly that. Very often, changes might happen during a show. A microphone might get move around. The band could be playing louder than at soundcheck. There could have been a DI that had a pad during the soundcheck that was accidentally knocked out before the show, or the opposite. There are many things that can happen, and the front of house engineer is there to observe it and make the required adjustments. I work as a full-time audio, audio engineer, but when I am playing with my band, I am a musician, and I do not have the brain capacity to be doing both things at once, playing the show and actively being an audio engineer. From the downbeat of the first song I'm, I'm playing, I can't really be actively monitoring the inputs. Sure, I'll make minor adjustments for my own mix, 
and some other band members might ask me to make some adjustments. There could be a problem with a channel that I don't have in my IAM mix, so there could be a big issue happening on stage without anyone really hearing it. 4. It's an extra thing that can go wrong. If you are using the 4816 as an output, for it to work there needs to be some routing done inside the console. This is an extra step where something can go wrong. There could be an issue with the routing, uh, a wrong scene might get recalled, someone might actually unpatch something while making other adjustments. I've had it happen during a show I was playing that I noticed my left and the right inner channels, they were swapped. So I went to the rack and I just swapped those around because yeah, I could solve the issue for myself pretty quickly. By doing that, I could have unpatched some something by accident because it's very likely that someone will be making some adjustments during a show and any of these adjustments could potentially cause something not to be routed correctly to the outputs. It's also possible during a live show that some problem will occur on stage and, and an input needs to be swapped. So if I will take channel 7 and put that into channel 18, maybe channel 18 is not being routed to my 4816 and thereby not going to front of house. I've also seen on the Wing Facebook group that people have sometimes had strange issues with the 4816 where it has needed to be power cycled or something. Now if everyone in the band is running IEMs and only front of house is getting outputs from the 4816, it's very possible that no one on stage notices that there is an issue with the outputs and front of house might not be in a situation to go on stage and fix the issue. The thing is that I see people talking about the 4816 as a cheap and easy to use split, but in fact a good old analog split can be cheaper, way easier to use, take up less space and way less. And it's also it's just less things that can go wrong. At the time of this video, the 4816 is 279 euros on Tommen and 309 euros on Sweetwater. The Seismic Audio 16 channel split is 289 from their website and that does include the tail to connect to front of house. Because you can't always expect the venue to have 16 XLR cables laying around to patch all your outputs after everything on stage has been wired up. There is also the Behringer Ultralink MS8008 channel mic splitters and other manufacturers make similar devices. The Behringer is $69 for an 8 channel splitter. I briefly mentioned those types of cheap transformer splits in my livestream and why I'm a bit skeptical on them. In my livestream I also showed how I was planning on building a 16 channel 1U split. The estimated cost for that split was around $145 or around €125. Euros. You can watch the livestream recording where I show the components I required for that build by clicking the link above. I also do plan on making a video when I build the split and if I have released that I will put the link above. Some of you might already have a setup using the 4816 split and used it successfully. I've seen people, oh I've used it and the front of house engineer was fine with it. The thing is, on the day of the show when you show up with your split, front of house knows he doesn't really have a choice. If there is an analog split at the venue, I guarantee he'll ask you to use that. But if not, he knows that he'll just have to live with it and do the best he can. He'll probably talk to it with his friends or whine on Reddit on how awful it was, to be honest. There are other ways of doing a digital split. For example, most manufacturers, if there is the same line of consoles, there's a way to connect them together to send all the channels in between over cat cable or something like that. In some cases, it's also possible to do this between manufacturers by using something like Dante or Mari. I have seen many people recommend these solutions on Facebook or Reddit by just saying just run a single CAT5 cable to front of house and give them the channels over AES50 or Dante. This can be a viable solution depending on the situation, but it still does not address the problem of taking gain control away from the front of house. Remember, the person getting paid to do the job. In some signals, it could be possible to have front of house doing the gains and sending the signals back to you, but that causes an issue for you since you don't have consistent gain from night to night and any adjustment front of house might make will affect your IEM mixes. My design theory on self-contained IEM mixing system is that they should work totally independently of what's happening at front of house and should work regardless if front of house has an X32, a Digicore Quantum or a Midas H3000. However, if you are touring with your own engineer and the front of house console, that is a totally different situation. In that situation you can do what you want because your front of house engineer is part of the system. He knows the system and he probably has access to your consoles and can therefore do gain adjustments if needed. 
he or she is also aware of the limitations of the setup. I could continue this discussion basically forever, but I feel like this should give some understanding on why you should not do the DN4816 or similar as a split. I might make a video in the future on when digital splits and gain sharing can be a viable solution. I did mention this briefly in my live stream, but if I have released a separate video on the topic, I will link that above. If that video has not yet been released, I'll just put the link to the live stream. I hope this video clears up some confusion. Please like this video and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. Please help me spread the word and eliminate the misconception there seems to be on this matter. I feel like most of the people recommending to use the 4816 as a split are band members who do not have a full understanding on the drawbacks of this setup. I don't believe you'll get many live sound professionals recommending this solution. If you do have any questions, comments or observations, please leave them in the comment section down below. Until next time, tack för mig.